Jim here, Scuba Instructor, Japan, you know the drill. I am really excited about today's video. I have a discussion with a friend of the channel. He's on his path to advanced and beyond, and he has a few questions about equipment and procedures. This is a very common conversation that comes up for me. I'm gonna add my input. Other folks out there watching, please add your information for Wesley. Uh, Wes or Wesley, Wes, thanks for joining today. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. Pardon me, we're coming from where now? Uh, I'm in Dallas, Texas right now. Got it, Dallas, Texas. And what we're gonna be speaking about today is uh, equipment, essential equipment for the advanced diver. I'm not sure how many items we're gonna have here, but. Well, I've got a few here. I guess a good place to start would be just a, a quick background for me to kind of let everybody know what level I'm at. Um, I'm, just in, I'm just a standard open water diver. I've got under 20 dives logged. Uh, and by logged, I mean, I've spent a lot of hours in the pool, but you can't really log those, you know what I mean? Nice. Um, and uh, going down the YouTube rabbit hole of, you know, what's better, backplate or wing or split fins oh or heavy fins or, you know, regulators and, and all of these <laughs> things, you, you start to... Uh, really have some questions after you the more that you learn about it you know what I mean so uh, that's kind of where I'm at I've made some uh, some purchases already I've got a, uh, a back plate and wing stainless steel I've got a long hose uh, primary donate set for my regulators um, mm -hmm. got fins wetsuits all that other stuff but there were a couple of questions that uh, after getting my learning materials for my advanced courses that I was kind of curious about Sounds so good. before you kick in before you kick in so just as an aside for the viewers now this is you know for me th this is actually one of my favorite levels of as an instructor uh, one of my favorite levels of, of student because you, you have people who are just coming to the, uh, the edge of their growth curve. They're, they're preeminently interested. They have a lot of questions. Uh, they're gonna be picking a direction. Um, they're very motivated uh, to learn. They're, they're great students. Um, it's a really great group of people to work with. So I'm, I'm very excited about this. And just as an aside, um, people will probably be interested. You're, you're actually going to be training with? Oh, uh, with Mr. James Blackman of Divers Ready. James and Divers Ready. All right. I've always wanted to, someday I'm going to maybe get to hook up with, with James in a collab because uh, I'm a real fan of his as well. So is he, oh, is yeah. he as cool in person? Oh, he's great. Um, you know, obviously I'm in Dallas, so I'm a, I'm a few states over, haven't gotten to speak with him in person. But I will tell you, you know, you call the number listed on his website. He answers the phone. It's, it's awesome. just him. It's just one on one. Uh, he's responsive and, and friendly and yeah, I'm excited about it. It's going to awesome. be a, it should be a good time. Awesome. All right. Okay. Let's get to those questions. Okay. So, uh, in going over like the, uh, the deep diver portion, it says you'll need to launch a DSMB from depth. Right. So I'm going to need a certain length of spool and right, right. now. I only keep about 30 feet on that spool hanging up behind me, um, you know, uh, 30, uh, 10 meters, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So what sort of length of, of spools should I be going for? Yeah. for is, it, yeah. is it easy to detach from, from behind you? Can you bring that over so we can have a look at yeah. it? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So just a standard little finger spool. Yeah. On a bolt, of course. There you go. All right. So this this spool. So I, I was before we had our chat, you know, I was I was going around and seeing if if things have, have changed much at all. But but typically um, spools like 15 meters, that's what 50 feet, or 30 meters, that's hundred feet, or 45 or 50 meters, which is more like 160 feet. And so for me. Um, and of course, you're going to check with, with your instructor, uh, you know, what he or she has in mind. But Absolutely. for me, for me, for my personal use, right, at first, I was like thinking, yeah, you know, the 50 meter, because I want to I want to have, um, you know, the ultimate flexibility 
And, you know, maybe I would use it as a supplement, you know, if I had some light penetration at a small wreck or, um, you know, if I had to launch from some extreme depth, I, you know, on a deco dive, I'd be covered. But then as time went on, I realized I never did that. And a 50 meter spool was pretty big in my pocket. And so when I'm choosing a spool size, I'm thinking, uh, I'm contrasting two different ideas. I'm contrasting real estate in my pocket, right? Because I have pocket shorts and contrasting that, what am I really gonna need? Now on the opposite end, the one that you have there is really only for safety stops, right? So your safety stop, um, you know, if, as you know, probably if you launch in a current, right? You're, so let's say, you know, I'm launching from 10 meters on my way up to my safety stop. And in a perfect world, you know, it's gonna be 10 meters, but no world is perfect usually, right? So if I have any current that's gonna launch at an angle and it might, run out of line before it hits the surface uh, so yeah. there yeah so there actually is a formula for that and i forget it but they, they do recommend a certain percentage uh, over um i used to be a deco diver so nowadays i go with a 30 right so a 30 what a 30 does for me it's a reasonable size that fits in my pocket easily and i could still launch for a 21 meter deco stop which is where deco stops start for general, like your first advanced nitrox deco procedures course, your, your first deco stop is gonna be 25, uh, sorry, 21 meters. So a 30 meter spool will probably still let me, you know, launch from like 23 meters if there's not too much current. And then I can use that for my successive uh, deco stops. And probably in that case, I would have a spare that is a 50, uh, 50 meter somewhere, somewhere less accessible, but Right in my right hand, my go-to for me is going to be the 30 meter for that purpose. So you recommend I should probably carry a smaller backup spool as well? Just a smaller than on smaller lengths? Well, the one that you have actually for me would be kind of small. Yes. Because uh, it, it, it basically it's, it's going to be good for your safety stops and you know maybe some general use. I mean, I've done some crazy stuff with spools. Like one time, I was in Thailand, Fifi, I think Fifi Island, and I was with three people. We rented scooters, and the boat just you know kicked off, and the scooters all ran out of battery, and the boat was nowhere around. I'm like, what the heck do we do now? And so I took my spool line, I cut it all up, we tied we tied the scooters to our back rings and we were just because it didn't have any bolt snaps. So we were just swimming with these scooters <laughs> hanging from us. So it's like Batman's utility belt a little bit. So a 15 is, is kind of small. It's going to be good for safety stops. And as I'm getting older, I'm not doing any deco dives. That's very often going to be enough. And it's so nice and small. Right. But if you think like, well, I'm hearing from you that you're going uh, eventually maybe the tech route, I think probably a 30 meter will be a lot more versatile. 10-4. And then uh, on that same topic of spools, is there a particular style that you prefer more over others, like the, the Goodman handle style, the finger spool? I, I saw a sidewinder just in perusing around, too. A sidewinder yeah. style. Yeah, they have some wild ones, don't they? Yeah. So, and that's wow. just adding to the confusion, like where, where should I really kind of try to go with this? You know what I yeah. mean? You know, there are, there are a lot of uh, designs out there that I've, that I've tried and people, you know, back when I was a lot more active, they would send me these nice uh, samples of these, you know, cool, like mini flippable lines and stuff like that. Uh, generally, the, the consensus, and please, you know, feel out James on this, you know, less is more. You know, everybody comes back to a basic spool in your pocket, no gimmicks on it, nothing to get jammed, nothing to get tangled, nothing to get rusted, nothing to, you know, get stuck up. Um, so my guess is what, what James would recommend is, you know what, have one thing that's a spool. And then later, you know, if you do go into rec penetration or some tech light courses like some introductory courses they will uh, like i used to uh, teach basic use of a reel and even those reels so there's like you know 150 to 400 feet uh, like a nice basic halcyon or a light monkey or dgs like a basic basic one not a lot of moving parts 
a lot of Delrin, not a lot of uh, rustable metal on there. And uh, that would be more for thinking penetration or you know, zero visibility laying line. Um, and he might ask you to, to introduce into that in, in some early tech training, just because a lot of instructors know that that's a difficult task. So they start building their students early. But I would definitely uh, ask James for that. He might even have a loaner for you until you, you find out exactly what it is you want to do. Gotcha. Yeah. So one of the other courses I'm doing is uh, Nitrox. I think that's it. I don't know if it's required for uh, advanced open water or if it's just a good idea to have Nitrox, but he was pushing that like you really should. So I'm going to do that. Um, and then in watching some of the other videos floating around, like the GUE guys, you know, uh, they are, you know, always carrying an oxygen analyzer, mm -hmm. always test every single tank every time. Is that something that I should bother investing in? Uh, because most of the centers here, if they're doing nitrox fills, they're going to have a tester. Right. Yeah. Do, mo do most folks uh, dive nitrox around there, do you think? Well, you just got there, right? You just moved there. Yeah, it's. I see it a lot. It's, it's pretty yeah. common down on the uh, Florida coast for sure. Um, yeah, I, I see it quite a bit. Right. And, and most uh, dive centers that I've been to also are, you know, filling nitrox easily. Yeah. 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 I would. Uh, so here, you know, my, my case is probably almost, I mean, every dive center has it when they're handing it to you, you're right in a center where they have uh, a tester. Um, when I was a tech diver, I had a tester, right? When I had um, tanks that were 100% and 50% oxygen and nitrox, when uh, it meant the difference, you know, on the beach testing one last time uh, that, you know, if someone grabbed this 100% instead of the 50%, it meant someone was going to die at death right. because they were ox tox, right? In that situation, I definitely uh, recommend, yeah, tech divers should have, should have a tester, uh, an oxygen tester. But for the average recreational diver, my personal thought, and I hope I'm not going to get uh, inter internet killed for this but my personal thought is I, I don't I don't need it at this moment right because everywhere I go has a tester as you said um, and I'm in no position where I'm going to be very far from the dive center just by the virtue of how it works and if it's the same for you um, and you're not messing in a situation where there's a hundred percent oxygen around or you know once you start to get in that situation you might want to consider it copy um all right moving on i guess so uh for my my dive computer uh it's very very basic it's it's a 180 eighty dollar cressy leonardo um mm. it's very simple the information that it displays it'll give me dive time water temperature uh max depth and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Obviously it counts down the, the no deco time and, and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. But mm -hmm. what it doesn't give me is kind of a fuller dive profile that would include, you know, the, uh, you know, oh, you spent 15 minutes at the 30 meter mark and then you came up to 20 meters and you spent 20 there it would only log the deepest part of my dive right. so what i started doing actually is uh just taking a a little wrist slate hmm. simple right <laughs> i just take that down with me and then every 15 minutes or so i'll notate depth gas remaining time hmm. and from there i can kind of start to build a better understanding of my dive profiles but going on the advanced diver portion am i going to need any more information available to me during a dive should i get a little better dive computer yeah good question i mean you're you're doing more than than probably most people do i think <laughs> uh, certainly more than more than i do so um the only thing the only thing that you're lacking in the information that you have that that i like to have for for my students is the average depth 
Um, so I have, let me see, I have two units. I have a very old uh, Stinger, um, a, uh, a Suto Stinger, and that gives you uh, average depth at, at the end of your dive, or probably there's a way to get it during the dive. I don't know what that is. And also I have a, what is it, Tech 3G, uh, which also gives you, you can choose to give you a running uh, average depth. And average depth is useful for calculating your air consumption. So what I do is for, for me, for advanced on every dive, uh, so what, what I'll have the students do, so they know their starting pressure, their ending pressure, and then their, their average depth. And then from that, they can calculate their, uh, their air consumption. And so that's one of the things I have that every dive, they calculate their air consumption just so they can have a running average. And it's good, it's good to see, you know, it also, it gives them some awareness rather than just looking at a tank and thinking, oh, yeah, this happened and look at, I, you know, I use this much air in a gross sense or this much air. You know, they can maybe think, oh, yeah, that dive, look at this. It was a very low average depth. But, oh, you know, I remember, you know, the entry and the eggs were really nasty there. I was working hard and that was causing me to use much air. Oh, yeah, look at this dive. You know, I wasn't so comfortable. Or look at this dive. Yeah, I was really dialed in. All my equipment was working right. My, my trim was right there, my buoyancy. And look at how low my air consumption was. So, yeah, the only other piece of information would, would be that. Um, so whatever whatever you know james recommends or if, if you're looking in the future an average something that has average depth i think is is pretty useful and beyond that i mean yeah i don't know i know that there are a lot of great computers out there and i, I think james sell what's a line he sells is it uh, i think he's a aqualung maybe i can't remember to be honest is with he, you what is it isn't it what is it the peregrine who sells the peregrine Oh, uh, Shearwater. Shearwater, right. So a lot of folks are going with these kinds of things and those have, you know, their, their displays beautiful, you know, it's bright, you know, and probably in almost zero viz, you can see that baby. Um, and it has all kinds of, uh, of connectivity. You know, when I was tech diving, which maybe is is the direction you're gonna go in. So probably you're, you're planning right. for that. You know, I just use, you know, the slate that you have, uh, you know, I had, wet notes in my pocket and I had a slate like you have right there on my arm. We used a V planner and you know, we'd go out, say, all right, you know, here's the depth we want to go to. Here's the gases we have. And, you know, we'd manage the, uh, the, the deco time that it was recommending and how much, de how much exposure we wanted to have to deco. Right. And, uh, and we would massage that. When we've all decided, yep, this is going to be our plan, we'd write that in all of our notes, and there was no deviation from that. You know that that was the plan, and we were going to dive it. And if anything was going to go wrong, we were going to come up earlier than that. So there right. was nothing that would add any danger to that. So honestly, I don't know how people feel about that these days. Um, you know, the danger, the danger of not pre-planning like that is and just following uh, um, a deco computer only is so when i pre-planned right so i knew at every depth right i'm going to breathe this much 50 percent here and then this much and then this much and this much so my 50 percent o2 i'm going to use this many liters and here are my tanks i know how much i'm bringing so right. I, I there there's no surprises however if you think about it if you don't pre-plan and the computer is just telling you, oh, spend this or oh, spend here. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's kind of a shot, I think, unless you, you pre-plan. And I, and I don't know how these computers pre-plan, but um, you, you see my point? Yeah, yeah, I get what you're, I'm picking yeah. up what you're putting down. Yeah, but James knows a lot more about this because like I said, I, I don't, I don't, you know, teach tech anymore, nor do I dive tech. So uh, you'll have it, but but the, the, the thing that was stressed to me and I stressed people is that, you know, pre-planning those kinds of dives as much as possible lets you pre-plan exactly how much gas you're going to need. And then of course, there's a cushion on top of that. But uh, rather than if you just say, 
if, if, and I don't think anyone does this these days, but you know, oh yeah, I have this kick-ass computer and we're going to do a, a 50 meter dive and then do whatever it says on the way up. You know, I mm. think that would be a plan that has a lot of question marks in it. Absolutely. The, the next question I had was about, uh, and what's the water temperature like over there in, in good old Japan? It's a little bit cool. It doesn't get as nearly as warm as where you're going to be. So <laughs> it gets to a lowest temperature is like, what then by my god it's 10 degrees i guess it's probably like almost 40 or maybe high 30s and then the warmest isn't all that warm it's probably like in the low 80s okay so if you were planning to do um you know this course and all of these certifications are going to take a week i'm going to do 20 dives throughout that week um it's it's likely, you know, it's the same time of year that I've been before where just a rash guard is fine. Swim trunks are fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing repetitive dives like that, you know, should you go a little above, maybe go for a three mil full suit or a shorty? Or what do you think about thermal protection in, let's say, you know, 75 degree water doing repetitive dives? Yeah, 75 degrees, I think is still kind of chilly. I mean, is it? I mean, when I was a kid in New Jersey, 78 was like the highest temp in the winter and oh, in the winter in the summer. And I thought, I thought that was chilly. Still but, pretty chilly. Uh, yeah. So 75. So for me, actually, let me think, 70 degrees is uh, kind of like a baseline where some people will even start dry suit. Um, oh, really? Uh, yeah, 68, right? So a lot of people would consider uh, like 70 degrees to be, that's that's as cold as I really wanna be uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a wet suit. So for me, if, if it's really 75, 75 for me, I only wear a five mil everywhere I go. So, because I don't want to have a bunch of suits anymore. So I have a five mil and I have a dry suit and I have a hooded vest. So even when I go to Florida and the water is like 80, whatever degrees, like high eighties and I'm on the boat, I'm sweating a little bit, but in the water, I'll never get overheated. So um, my, my thought is with you is, yeah, I would guess that I would, you would enjoy full coverage with that much exposure at, at that temperature. Um, and probably over time, you want to minimize uh, for your environment, like the number of pieces of stuff that you need to have. So usually I'm going to try and, and have one, uh, one wetsuit that, that covers almost everything I have and a hooded vest, which is going to be add a month at the beginning of the season and a month at the end of the season, and then dry suit if I need anything outside of that. Because I see. You, know, you can only have so much room for your toys, right? Yeah, uh, depending on how nice your spouse is. <laughs> so you got a shorty back there, right? Those are nice. Yeah, it's uh, just a little two and a half mil shorty. Um, yeah. You know, and actually I went diving in it uh, two, maybe a week and a half ago. Hmm. Uh, I did that with some uh, one and a half mil pants under that and just my rash guard and the water temperature yeah. was sitting at... Um, Oh gosh, what was it? 65. And I was fine. I was okay. fine in just that two and a half mil, you know, right. with a one and a half mil set of pants yeah. on. Well, you know what? See, that's the other thing that, that's hard to say. Like when, when people like come to Japan and I think Japan is cold, right? Because compared to everywhere else around here, like, you know, Thailand, Philippines, you know, Malaysia, you know, they're all much, much warmer, Indonesia. And uh, even, right, right so on the east coast right we have a freakish freakish condition we have the jet stream uh coming mm -hmm. up uh sorry the jet stream we have the gulf stream coming up the jet stream i'm getting older so we have the gulf stream so we are a lot warmer than we should actually be right and so for me japan's water is a lot more like when i was in california california the water was always cold for me right like, what is going on here so um you know for me i i and you know, I'm always going to tell people, they come over, oh, what am I going to need? 
And I say, well, you know what? It depends on you. I get cold actually kind of easily. And probably, you know, I wear more neoprene than, than a lot of folks. But you, like, like you're saying, probably, Wes, I wouldn't be comfortable in that temp with what you're wearing, it sounds like. Um, so, uh, yeah, to each his own. And I tell people that. I said, you know, judge yourself. If you're a person who gets cold easily, wear a five. You know, if you're a person who, you know, doesn't, you know, maybe wear a three. So it sounds like you're uh, maybe have some Viking blood there or something. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I should be good. Even with repetitive dives, the water's about 10 degrees warmer on average than what I was diving there. I did. Yeah, that's probably fine. You're good. You're good. Uh, the one, the one thing, before you move on, the one thing that I would say is, uh, and you're doing exactly the right way, but a lot of people are tempted to not have full coverage. Now you mentioned, um, uh, pardon me, you mentioned uh, the dive skin, or is that a rash guard? Pardon me. A rash guard. We rash call guard. it a dive skin. I think it's interchangeable. Gotcha. And I think you bring up a great point because that is super important because, you know, if you dive long enough, with parts of your body uncovered, you you know, bad stuff is going to happen. You know, I mean, I have been stung by so many weird things and oh, including, yeah. including pieces of things. One of the times I got stung the worst, actually, uh, gosh, where was I? I think I was in Malaysia. I was on a tech course and we got demolished. I had full coverage and, and a hood, but there, there were like some shredded jellyfish and oh, just like a there oh, oh. through and tore them up yeah so it was just pieces of jellyfish and wes i was getting the only part of me that was exposed was around my mouth and i was getting stung like crazy all just that was it that's all that they could get and but the guys some of the guys around me wearing shorties were getting demolished Right. So you never know what you're going to run into. I would, you know, you're, you bring up a great point. I would always wear at least a dive skin, no matter how warm it is. Yeah. Well, and then beyond that, there's the environmental thing because there's sun, you know, SPF like 50 and less sunscreen in the water, better for the coral. Good point. Better for your Good skin. point. Oh, that's a great point, Wes. Yeah. Good point. Uh, do you happen to wear corrective lenses? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, you still got a couple of years on you <laughs> yeah how about you uh yeah i wear contacts and okay. uh so what i did i got a uh prescription you know mask for uh before i even started my pool drills and um and i think that was a good way to go because doing the you know the clearing and the mask removal and everything else if i were in contacts they'd be yeah. gone Agreed. But now, just on a normal day-to-day -day dive, you know, if you go out to the site, I have to wear my regular reading glasses or mm. my regular glasses, I guess. They're not readers, but I have to take those with me. I have to take a hard case yeah. for those glasses because the only mask that I have right now is a prescription one. Right. And I can't wear my contact with that. So, gotcha. Yeah. I, I was going to ask for your opinion on on diving with contact lenses, if you had any experience with that, but that's yeah. good for you that you don't. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, my, my students uh, generally, I, you know, you, you made an, ex an excellent summary there. You know, um, I think in the long run, especially going the training progression that you're gonna go in, um, you know, your face is, is gonna be getting a lot more water as time goes on, right? I mean, a lot more. Yeah. So. So yeah, it's just really, really hard to, to manage that. So most people go with a prescription mask as you know, many difficulties as that does introduce, like you're saying. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess, always good to see underwater though, than to, you know. Yeah. You got to so you you near sighted? If you can't see. Oh, sorry. Uh, you're... And, oh, wait. Is that? Yeah, near sighted. Yeah, uh, myopic. So I can see things close, but far away and at a distance, mm. Forget about it. Got it. Got it. So. Yeah. What's happening to me, and, and this is uh, common as people get older, right? So um, I, I was slightly nearsighted. And then uh, as my lens uh, gets harder and, and it, it, it ceases to focus close, so I'm losing the, the close distance here. 
and what people will do. And, 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 and that's a little, yeah, exactly. And that's a little bit um, advantageous because in the water will actually slightly counteract that effect. Um, and uh, they do make these gauge reader glasses, uh, masks. Oh. So I, yeah, I have one. I haven't, I, I've had it for two years. I'm waiting to need it. Uh, and what <laughs> happens is, yeah, it's got permanent, permanently <laughs> gauge readers here. So it's out of your main vision. Uh, I think mine are excess scuba and it, it, it's only purpose. It's for people who, yep. They can see the stuff, but they can't read the gauges. And those are out there. And those are very reasonable as, as an alternative for some folks. Interesting. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah. OK, let's see. What did I? What else do I have here? Ah, you are uh, the preferred method of noise makery while underwater mm. to get other people's attention. Wow. What do you have now? Just a tank banger. Yeah. Yeah, just a little strap on there. And and the only reason I bought that is because it was, you know, this is the most economical. And I have had a few situations where I'm trying to wave my buddy down, but you know, I'm on top of him or or you know, I gotta grab his fin and shake him a little bit because maybe not being the best buddy. You know right. what I mean? Right, right, right. So I just yeah. got a little tank banger to to click and let him know that, hey, talk to me. Gotcha. But I uh, heard a lot of people don't really care for the rattlers, you know. Yeah. There's also the, the <laughs> they call it the air two, the uh oh, yes. integrated. Yeah, that goes into your BC. It sounds like a almost like a duck quacking underwater. Right. Uh, yeah, I've uh, seen yeah, the, uh, the hammerhead. Or there's also the, yeah. Or there's also just, you know, and it didn't occur to me until after I bought the tank banger. I've got a knife hanging oh. right there. Yeah, I could just take that out, tap the back yeah. of my tank, and that yeah. would have solved the problem. Yeah. I just didn't think about that, though. You know? All right. Okay, on this one, uh, are you ready to have your mind blown a little bit? Yeah. Let's okay. Yeah, because this is probably going to go in a direction you might not have, heck have expected. So um, my guess is in, in the direction that your diving is going, you're going to need that sort of thing less and less or not at all. Uh, one, because you're going to be improving your buddy skills. And two, you're probably going to be choosing not to dive with people who would require those kind of extraordinary um, actions to, to, to have their attention. Uh, and you might take a different direction. So um, I, I'm always wearing a light now. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I have a Goodman uh, dive light that's a, uh, it's a very narrow beam. And that is my preferred communication device. And if, if a buddy that I'm diving with uh, is not on the ball, like looking for my light down in front of his or her field, or if, uh, yeah, I mean, if they're not, that, that's, that's probably a person who I'm going to have to educate. Or, you know, if that kind of, if, if they're that difficult to get their attention well what if i really needed their attention for an emergent issue exactly that it's not going to happen <laughs> so, yeah so it would be two things one uh first i would be addressing the buddy skills so if i really have buddies that are that difficult that you know i don't know where they are and i have to use some sort of a tank banging device or a noise making device I, instructors we we often do do this one actually oh um, yeah, it works better with, with bare hands, but, but this, yeah, you can, you know, make that sound underwater. Um, but, uh, you know, hammerheads and quackers and all that, you know, I, I have no part of, of anything like that. I have a dive light and the dive light I wear every dive and that is the communication tool. And the way we work, um, is, you know, always moving our lights into each other's field. Uh, so that we have a constant feedback without looking for our buddy. And definitely, you know, if it gets super bright at some point in time, that might not work. Uh, but, you know, then you have to, you know, be, be looking actually at the buddy. But in general, this sounds to me more like a, a buddy skill uh, and agreement with, with your buddy than it is uh, a noisemaker. My guess is you're not going to need a noisemaker. 
once once you're once you're finished with all this training and you and you continue on that path. That's my guess. Copy that. So it's almost a, a different communication system that you're just using primarily with the lies to get each other's attention. But that also, yeah. But also, a communication system and expectations with the buddy very clearly communicated. Like uh, you know, literally. I mean, I don't. You know, I don't really do many ser ser what I would consider serious dives anymore. I mean, my depth is pretty limited, you know, but if I were doing a lot of, you know, 30 to 40 meter dives, you know, in serious conditions uh, where, you know, there's currents of darkness and danger. And if I had a buddy that I could not, you know, look over and, and find that person predictably uh, a couple, more than a couple times, we're having a serious talk and or I'm not going to dive with that person in these kinds of conditions. That's almost more important than, than the light. I like that. That's a good yeah. answer. Hmm. Um, I think the only other thing I really had written down to talk about was fin styles. Oh, yeah. I'm not even gonna bring up split. I'm not even gonna say the S word, right. although I just did. But um, so on my last dive, I was doing a, uh, um, a swim through on this, called a hollow metal tube. It's, mm. it's a giant shark sculpture that mm. you can swim through. It was really, really cool. Never mm. done a swim through before, but it seemed like there was, you know, more than enough room for, for me to comfortably get through within those, you know, training standards that specify exactly what you need to do. Anyway, um, I felt like I was hovering really, really close to the bottom, but I still felt these big old fins mm. banging the top, you know? I'm okay. doing a, like a modified frog kick, but it still felt like they were getting pretty floaty and they yeah. were just kind of hitting the top. So I'm wondering if maybe it's just that these fins are a bit too long. Um, yeah. Maybe they're a bit too buoyant. Is right. there a, a better... Uh, brand I should be looking for or like an overall style that I should be trying to go after? Uh, that's a great question. So, and, and we did talk about this a little bit before. So um, what, what brand are those? They are Tusa. Um, okay. Tusa gotcha. Sola. Fit. Got it. All righty. Yeah. So, you know, as I had mentioned for, for me, right, they're, they're kind of two, two camps of, of fin users, um, right? They're like flutter kickers for speed, speedy flutter kickers. And then they're the slow, uh, slow frog kickers, which is me. Um, so I, I like using, you know, slow, powerful strokes. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be chasing stuff. I'm beyond that age. I'm not, I'm not, you know, in fact, if, if I'm moving fast, everybody who knows me, if I'm moving fast on a dive, it's because I'm cold. <laughs> I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to get warm. Um, so if, if the direction or the dive that, that you're going in is something where you want precision and, uh, and you know, back kicking and, you know, helicopter kicking, probably you could do with, with either fin, but especially back kicking and, and maybe little precision um a frog kick also as you know is going to be a non-silting kick right because the fins come out and when they come together they're usually not coming together perfectly parallel they're usually more like cupping and so the the water force is going down and generally up uh, sorry it's going back and upward it's not really going uh, it's definitely not going down so right. that another reason why uh people would prefer that um, so in that situation, also, if I'm wearing a dry suit, right, I want uh, a fin, I'd prefer a fin that's heavier rather than light. Uh, so those are the situations and that's pretty much me all the time now. So I'm going to choose a heavy, short, fat fin, like you mentioned, which one were you considering? Uh, the RK threes. That's a really Just popular right. one. Also the, I've got uh, the pro jets i think they they all kind of have the basic same design at the end of the day yeah. so with that one it really yeah. doesn't seem like the brand is no innovation there <laughs> matter yeah yeah the nice thing about the rk3 that you mentioned is uh i mean it comes with the springs so mm -hmm. uh, my yeah. uh 
my scuba pros, you know, so I've had scuba pro jet fins and I've had turtle fins, which turtle fins are kind of famous because they, the, the largest size has a monster foot pocket, which is good for dry suit uh, boots. For your so if you have a dry suit very often, those boots are like big military looking things. And turtle, I think they're three XLs are about the only pockets that, that seem to fit easily. So, um, but with those, you would generally have to add the springs. So I think the RK3s are a, a pretty good, a pretty good choice because they come with the springs. Um, now on the other end of the spectrum are the fins like you have. Now, guys who spearfish, uh, guys who also want to free dive, uh, people who like doing a flutter kick, uh, you know, people who like moving around quickly, uh, you know, those people are going to favor a lighter fin like like you illustrated a, a set of of my rk3s i cannot be doing some fast flip through the water you will be very disappointed uh, <laughs> so very so the the fins that, that you mentioned are perfect so i have um what are they avambi quattros are my my mm -hmm. fins that i use like for free diving or, or when i went for the whales this it was a snorkeling trip when i went for the whales that was what i was wearing or you know if i really I, I, I'd like to try and spearfish someday if I were in a situation uh, where, where that was legal and possible. I'm not right now, but if I were spearfishing, I would wear the Avanti Quattros, right? If I needed to possibly chase something down. Another thing that I've seen on video, and it's a definite thing, if you're going the tech diving route, if you have a set of doubles on your back and you have a stage tank and you look at someone, a video of someone doing a frog kick with all that weight, what you're gonna see is those fins will collapse and crumple. Ah, oh, interesting. The fins, are, the fins are being overpowered by what they're trying to drive. Uh, so those more flexible fins uh, will have a limit in terms of how much uh, load they can drive. And if, you're, if and when you're going the, the tech diving route, uh, probably something stiffer is going to suit you better. Copy that. So that would be my, be my console there. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's about all the equipment questions I had for you today. I really cool. appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with me and clear up a couple of things. As you know, opinions are always kind of all over the place, and scuba board is going to be what scuba board is. Mm. So uh, just nice to talk with an instructor and and get that opinion on it so i appreciate it it's great to have the instruction mate i i'm really i'm envious of your of your journey right i mean you're at a you're at a great spot right and usually and i, and I haven't asked you this but usually people at your uh your juncture there they might often be thinking gosh you know which route am i going to go in my future am i going to go the pro route am i going to go dive master route or am i going to go the tech route or maybe is it going to be both or are you kind of thinking that kind of thing? Right. Well, that's the next tree that you you come to, you know, mm -hmm. after you get through this and uh, you get the dives under your belt, it's, well, do you want your dive master certification? And then at that point, you know, you start looking at insurance and things like that. Um, I honestly don't feel like I have the patience uh, necessary to to teach people the way that they deserve to be taught. So for me, I'm definitely wanting to go more the, uh, the technical route. Gotcha. Uh, that's you, you know what's, yeah, you, you know, it's a nice uh, certification actually. So in uh, one of the differences between the, uh, the PADI route, let me, and, oh, let me back up also. What, what is James, is James SSI? S S I or S D I? It's one okay. of those. I think S S I for that. But I think I know it's definitely not Patty. I know that. <laughs> no, I think actually on the technical front he's S D I. But for the other um, certifications that he would do, it's going to be S S I. Got it. Perfect. Yeah. So um, so in the the Patty route, so your uh, knowledge development. Right, your knowledge development, like the big textbook, and you know the serious knowledge development and skills development, happens at dive master level. However, in the Nawi route, all of that knowledge development and a lot of the skills happens 
before the dive master route in what's called master diver. Um, so you have this big fixed textbook and you know you have some serious dives and serious skills and there are like these tasks to do that are uh, you know like underwater taking on and off and challenging yourself. You know there, there are definitely some things and I'd be curious to know in SSI what that is. I, you know that's a question to ask James. I'm totally unfamiliar. But you know it might be that uh, so so what I would tell people is well, you know if you want to kind of I, I definitely recommend tech for everybody who's interested in it because that is a no brainer. I mean just develop you know your skills. However, on the way, you know, if someone wanted to be all they could be as a recreational diver and not go pro, I would definitely recommend a master diver program in a system like NAWI um, would be really, uh, I think, beneficial for folks if they didn't want to go pro. And then actually in the NAWI system, um, then from master diver to dive master is a much smaller step than in the PADI system Master Diver is really a, quite a low level certification. So the Master Diver to Dive Masters is, is a large step. So someone could could make that, but going the tech route is definitely the way to go, I, I believe. I'm excited about it. It's, yeah. uh... All right, Wes, well, I, I, I thank you so much for being a, you know, a viewer and a participant in the channel for for as long as you have, I, I uh, so much appreciate having your, your input and your comments and, and now participating in the travel. Thanks a lot. And hopefully we can have another conversation uh, in the future. I look forward to that. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Thanks.